Welcome back to Park City Television. Are you looking for some inspiration in your life? Do you enjoy hearing stories of incredible triumph against amazing odds? Well, I have the honor of speaking with Russell Fredenbaugh right now here in our studios in Park City, Utah. He has an amazing story, incredible life. He's recently written a book called Shift the Narrative, and right now they are filming a documentary of his life. So, Russell, thanks for being here today. Christine, glad to do it. Let's just get started. You have really overcome great odds in your life. You grew up in a pretty normal environment until something really big happened to you. I say, um, I was a very ordinary 16 year old boy living in Salt Lake County. And I was influenced by our then president, John Kennedy, who made a declaration saying, we'll put a man on the moon and bring him back alive in this decade. So like every 16 year old boy, I, I thought I would be an astronaut and I thought I'd start by building a rocket, learn how they work. In doing that, I managed to explode the rocket while I was holding it. It has left me missing six fingers and sight. Um, that was back in 1962. You remind me of my 16 year old actually. He's always building things in the garage, making things, and unfortunately you had a horrible accident. A lot of things happened along the way, but you decided after this accident when you were recovering that you weren't gonna let it define you. You weren't gonna be a victim. You lost your sight, you lost your fingers. What played into that decision? In 1962, the prospects for a, a average student male, 16 year old, who was blind and missing many fingers, looked pretty bleak. It looked there would be no way I would ever be able to have a good job or even a good date. So I made what I now know as a declaration that day in the hospital when the doctor said, we've done all we can for you. Um, the declaration was that I would not live as a blind person, that I would live and work and move in the sighted world doing sighted things and I would be valuable in that world. And so that began this journey called that I now call shifting my narrative or shift the narrative in which I needed to change my story about what it is to be blind what is blindness and I needed to change the opinion of sighted people around me so that they would forget that I was blind you, know, you mentioned in your book that your mom even kind of gave up on you having a normal life, going to college, getting married, doing all of these things that she thought you would do before the accident, but you even proved her wrong, but it was almost a way for her to cope with what the reality was. But in fact, you did go to college, you did do all these things. Well, yes, and she was reflective of the common sense at that time about what is blindness and what few things can be done by people who are blind. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, I needed to prove her and the whole culture wrong. You absolutely did. You went to the University of Utah, mm -hmm. graduated top in your class in economics. F first. First in your class. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a point to me. Yes, first in my class. Go ahead. And then you went on to higher education. Right, the Wharton School uh, in Philadelphia, where I was fifth, a graduate school. And my mother said, what did the other four do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Makes you wonder. But yes. But you even had to prove with people in the higher education world who thought we can't accept this student because of his disabilities. You had to fight against that. Oh, absolutely. It, yeah, my first choice, Harvard, said uh, we won't even accept your 
$25, that was a lot of money then, uh, check, uh, we can't accept you, there's no way a blind person could ever manage a program as difficult as ours. Stanford University said the same thing, except they kept the $25 check. <laughs> that was enough to buy uh, uh, 100 gallons of gasoline. Wow. Um, way back then. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the point is, so then I went to Wharton School, which is uh, number three, and I gave them an opportunity to make Harvard and Stanford look silly. I interviewed the Dean of Admissions and told him my plight, mentioned of course Harvard and Stanford, and he said, uh, you're in. I'm not even going to take your file to the committee. And you'll be just like anybody else. If you can't do the work for whatever reason, you'll leave, as those others leave. So. Which is exactly what you wanted. You didn't want any special accommodations. No, I didn't need any. And um, uh, anyway, Wharton is a school f about investing. Mm -hmm. They made an investment in me. Which you gave back. Of course. Tenfold, even more than that, because well, you uh, are a successful investor. Right. Yes. Yep. And they have some contributions. <laughs> so you proved them wrong, had an incredible career mm -hmm. as an investor, but along the way you've also picked up some other incredible talents, such as you are a world champion fighter. Yes. Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, three-time world champion gold medal, um, fighting sighted opponents with all their fingers. So this isn't a special competition. You are in no. with the best fighters in the world, and you're beating them. Right. Well, only three times. Well, only three times. <laughs> I mean, three tournaments. <laughs> so you're gold medal, three-time champion, black belt as well. Uh-huh. Successful investor. How There had to have been times where you felt extreme discouragement, maybe even depression. How did you work through that? All the time, or frequently. That was the case. I remember one time I was finishing Wharton, the graduate school, and I had no job offers. None. I had 49 interviews and 49 no's. Even the government said no twice. And I was staying with a friend of mine, uh, a Utah named Kim Oldroyd, Springville, Utah old fraternity brother, and he said, if you were a stock, I would buy you. And, and I, I am a stock, and I own all of me. I'm going to make them all wrong <laughs> and have fun doing it. Which you absolutely have. You seem to have an incredible outlook. I mentioned at the beginning of the interview that this is an inspiring story. But you don't want to just be an inspiration. Inspiration is the booby prize. It's like champagne. It's no good if it's left out. It, it can't last overnight. Inspiration kind of evaporates by the time you get home. It's what you do with it. It's the declarations you make. One of the things I talk about when I, when I give talks is be aware of all the times that you're unconsciously being a victim. Well, I'm never a victim. Oh yeah? How about every time you say it's not my fault? Or I couldn't help it? Or the situation made me do it? Those are unconscious examples. Anyway, inspiration good if it leads to some declaration that leads to some change, then it's worth it. Otherwise, it's just an entertainment. And change is difficult and time-consuming, and that's why we need to make our declarations not merely to our pillows, but to the friends and family who will hold us to account. 
you have this book and the documentary. What are some takeaways that you hope people will get from participating in your life story? If he could do it, anybody could do it. I mean, that's the way I feel about becoming a, a jiu-jitsu ch champ. If I could do it with these hands and outside and without sight, anybody could be a black belt gold medal. That's a big takeaway. What are all the, th ask yourselves, what are the questions, what are the stories that hold you back, that keep you on the couch, that keep you from not applying to that adult education course to learn how to do whatever? You know, if, you, if ever you say to, you, you hear yourself say, oh, I can't do that because I'm too young, too old, too short, too tall, too female, too male, you're, you're drinking the Kool-Aid. And there's also fear as well. Fear plays into a lot of people and the decisions that they make and or don't holding make, them back. Or don't make. Right. Right. How do you handle fear, especially if you're, you're fighting on a world stage, you could fall, you could, so oh, many no, things could not happen. No, not you could fall. The opponent's goal is to throw you to the ground. <laughs> but you could fail in front or, of the world spectacularly. Well, Does that ever hold you back? Or how do you keep, obviously it doesn't, how do you keep that from well, defining it, you? In any two-player sport, someone's going to lose. So it's, if you, it, in any two-person game, there will be a winner and a loser. Kind of sounds like life. There are winners and losers. I'm more afraid of being a permanent loser than I am of losing. Also, there aren't any good lessons in victories. The big learning, the big change comes from our defeats. So losing is an opportunity to re-examine what do I need to do differently? What can I learn from this? Right, what, what can I learn from this? When you look back on your life, would you, if you could, if you could go back in time, would you change what happened that day in the garage? Would you do things differently? That's a hard question, but I'm curious. It, it, the reason I'm, I'm laughing is that uh, uh, it's a question I answered yesterday to myself. Um, no. If I had not done what looked like a tragedy at the time, I wouldn't be me. I'd probably be retiring from owning a shrinking candy manufacturing business, which is my family's business. You wouldn't be interviewing me. I wouldn't have gone to graduate school. I might need all of that. I wouldn't have had the, the life that I've had. So, no, I wouldn't change it. You've also had people placed in your life at the exact right moment. You mentioned in your book, your neighbor that was a nurse mm, who was able yes. to save you. Your uncle is Senator Jake Garn. All these people have helped you along the way. Yes, many people have helped, including many that don't even know how much they've helped. Um, I'm standing on the shoulders of so many people, friends, teachers, lovers, and um, yeah, in, in life we have many opportunities. I consider myself post-traumatic gifted because of the capacities I've developed as a consequence of what happened in that day in May of 1962 in that family garage. So life is always contingent. It really is, and you have to shift the narrative as mentioned in your book. Exactly, so all these 
opportunities between the tragedy of birth and the, uh, and the un and the certainty of death are opportunities to shift the narrative. You know, you've inspired and motivated so many people. How can we follow along with your journey? What are you doing next? How can we get your book? For people that are interested in learning more about you, where should they go? Oh, my PR person is going to kill me that I didn't lead with this. Uh, I, I have a website um, I'll, I'll, or a Facebook page. Yeah, it's Facebook. I'll, and I'll think of it in a minute. I think it's called Shift Russell. We'll put it up on the screen. Yeah, please. I, uh, I'm unprepared for these things. I'm not very good at them. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I, I post something there very frequently. Um, little Russellisms or aphorisms or uh, pretentious wisdom things. Um, so that's the mechanism, and I'm sure there's information there about how to, how to acquire the book from Amazon. What are some of your goals for what's next? To stay engaged profoundly, intellectually, all my, the days of my life, to deepen my understanding of myself and, and the world. Because we're in a phase where the world is turned upside down. Things that couldn't possibly have happened in our imagination are happening, like the negative interest rates on high-grade European and Japanese bonds. There's something absolutely different about what is happening everywhere in the world, all around the world, than, than the last 70 years. From very big demographic, geographic, technological, and political changes. My, my goal is to celebrate that we're very well positioned to navigate safely through, when I say we, I mean the, the U.S. citizens. Uh, and, and while doing that, I also want to, to be a, the bringer, uh, 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 the Johnny Appleseed of people discovering when they're being unconsciously a victim and when they move and showing them how to move to correct that for their sake so you can have a better life. Well, you're absolutely doing that. You've definitely made me think and not only am I inspired, I'm motivated to act differently and to kind of reevaluate my narrative. So thank you so much, Russell, mm -hmm. for being here today and talking with us here at Park City Television. It really has been an absolute honor. Christine, thank you. All right, check out Russell's book, Shift the Narrative. Also, be on the lookout for his upcoming documentary. Don't let your circumstances define you. Shift your narrative. Be your best self and find a way to not be a victim. All lessons that we learned today from Russell. We'll be back with more after this.